Welcome to our second lecture of the Phenolop uh, seminar series PILS. My name is Uwe Rascher. I'm from the Forschungszentrum Jülich, but I also hold a professorship at the Bonn University and I'm a PI of the Phenolop cluster. Today, I would like to introduce you to some concepts how we can use light to measure plant structure and plant function. Or in other words, I want to speak about photons, pigments and how they interact. To give you an overview what to expect in the next 30 minutes, I have four topics which I want to cover. I first would like to give you some concepts behind what is the nature of light, what are photons and how do they interact with plant pigments. I then want to introduce you a little bit technically about what is between the term of multispectral and hyperspectral measurements and what are vegetation indices. These concepts are linked or uh, spiced up with some real-world examples how we can really use the vegetation indices or the measurement concepts in agricultural science for proximity and remote sensing in plant phenotyping. And in the past five minutes, or in the last five minutes, I then would also like to uh, introduce you to the concept of fluorescence. So let's get started. And if we talk about light, we first of all can think big and can start from the sun, which is our main source of light and but also energy. And the energy emission of the sun travels through space, hits the surface of the earth and the energy which is carried uh, by this electromagnetic radiation or by these photons, this is the energy which drives all the life on earth. And having said that the importance of this light, we should think about what is this light at all? What are photons? And for this, we can use a pretty simple uh, concept and consider photons as a constant flux of elementary particles. These elementary particles travel with light speed, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. And as these photons are elementary particles, their behavior and their properties are best described by using a wave function. And a wave function shown here schematically, if we look a little bit and think a little bit more closely, what is a wave function or how do we describe a wave function? We can use two parameters to describe this wave function, especially in the case when we assume that the amplitude in the case of photons is more or less constant. So if the amplitude is constant, then it's enough to describe a wave function by either measuring the wavelength, which is the distance between two maxima, or alternatively by measuring the frequency, means to measure how often does this wave function oscillate in a second. And if you now consider that this photons travel with light speed, 300,000 kilometers per second along this line, then you can either measure the distance, the wavelength or the frequency. And whatever you prefer and whatever gives you easier units, the, you can describe the property of this wave function by either the wavelength or the frequency. And you can also simply consider that the more often uh, this photons oscillates, that means the higher the frequency is or the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy of um, this uh, photon is. Or in the other direction, you have a lower energy if you have a lower frequency and a longer wavelength. And from this concept, um, along this whole spectrum where photons uh, and electromagnetic radiation is emitted by the sun, you will realize that this visible light, which we know as light in the strict sense, is only really a small spectral window somewhere in this whole uh, spectral range of electromagnetic radiation which, which occurs. And this visible light is the small spectral window which occurs uh, in the spectral range of 400 to 700 nanometers. So light is normally measured by wavelength and the typical wavelength of this photons which we as humans can see as visible light is in the range of 400 to 700 nanometers. Always keep in mind that this is only a small window in the whole electromagnetic spectrum. If you go in the direction of a lower energy, means longer wavelength, you also have the infrared radiation, microwave, radio waves, and so on. And if you go in the other direction, higher energy radiation, then you come to the UV radiation, X-rays, gamma rays, which you know being really energy-rich um, electromagnetic radiation. For today's talk, we will focus on this visible range and go a little bit to the left and to the right uh, 
uh, uh, to um, explain how we can use this information for measurement purposes. So let's go back to our photon, which comes from the sun, travels through the uh, vacuum of, uh, and then as the first thing when it approaches the Earth, the first thing which this photon hits or penetrates is the Earth atmosphere. And even though the Earth atmosphere often seems transparent to our human eye, nevertheless, you all know that the Earth atmosphere consists of different gases and particles. And on the path through the Earth atmosphere, the photons first of all interact with the particles in our Earth atmosphere. And the interaction can be, I don't go into the detail because this is mainly for physicists, but the interaction can be refraction when the photons uh, penetrate through a denser medium, the path uh, is refracted, or the photons may collide with the little small particles in our Earth atmosphere uh, with the uh, aerosols and may be scattered. Or, as the third part, the Earth atmosphere consisting of CO2, oxygen, water vapor may also absorb these photons by uh, the really absorption of the photons with the components, the gaseous with the components of our Earth atmosphere. And as a result, if we consider what is the uh, composition of the photons which come from the Sun, this is the outer, outer graph, and when I measure the composition of the photons, of the stream of photons from the Sun on the Earth's surface, you can see that this, this is greatly altered and that some of the photons of a specific wavelength, for example, are absorbed by the water absorption or by the water in our Earth atmosphere or also by the uh, carbon dioxide. So on this ground, keep this in mind, if we measure the spectral composition of the photons on our Earth atmosphere, we see a pretty complex pattern of photons uh, in some uh, spectral windows uh, occurring, but then we also have spectral windows where we have almost no photons hitting the surface of our Earth. But now we are on the Earth and the photons can finally interact with a plant leaf or a plant canopy. And now let's think about what happens in terms of reflection, absorption and transmissions of photons when they interact with plants. For this, first of all, uh, let's dive deeply into the pigments of a plant. Pigments are those components which have a specific color, so they really interact well uh, with photons. And one of the pigments which you may know is the chlorophyll here in a chemical formula. This is the main pigment of the photosynthetic apparatus. And this pigment is built to actually absorb light from the sun, to absorb photons. And if you look on the chemical formula of this chlorophyll or also on carotenoids, which you see here, they all have a same biochemical scheme. And this consists of an uh, alteration of single and double bonds between this uh, carbon molecules, carbon atoms, sorry. And this um, single double bonding is specifically built biochemically that these pigments are built to absorb photons uh, uh, from coming from the sun. And this absorption of photons means, so what does absorption of photon mean, is that if a photon passes by this pigment in close proximity, that the energy of this photon is absorbed by the pigment. The energy, which is in the photon originally, is used to shift the, pig, the electrons in the pigment to a higher energy rich state. And the photon, which was carrying this energy before, disappears. So absorption of light means really transfer of energy from a photon into the electric energy in the pigments. And in terms of photosynthesis, that's what the plant wants to do. And that's why the pigments were developed by evolution, because this energy then is used by the plant to try photosynthesis and to uh, finally fix carbon dioxide. And if you now look on the spectral properties of this pigment, again, here you have the wavelength and these graphs are the chlorophylls. Then you see that, for example, chlorophyll specifically absorbs photons which are in a wavelength or have a wavelength between 400 and approximately 480 nanometers. Then there's a spectral window between 500 and 600 nanometers where chlorophyll is not interacting with photons. But then again, around between 600 and 700 nanometers, chlorophyll again can absorb uh, those photons. Absorbing photons means the energy is harvested and stored 
uh, to be used in photosynthesis. Another important thing is that this, what I wanted to show here, is that the absorption of the photons is really wavelength dependent and that, for example, chlorophyll has this really specific absorption features in the blue and in the red and not in the green, which is also the explanation why plants appear green, because the photons are not absorbed by the chlorophyll. So, having said this, let's now go back a little bit in our schematic leaf. What I show you here is a really schematic cross-section through a leaf, upper epidermis, lower epidermis and all the cells in the leaf. And if you now consider what happens to a photon if it hits this leaf, it pretty much has three fates which can occur. And the first fate is that the uh, photon just penetrates through the leaf. No interaction with pigments. Within the split of a second, the photon penetrates through the leaf. It's transmitted. Or, second part, the photon is reflected. This can happen at the hour layer, but also in some other layers in the cell. So it's reflected in um, and not being absorbed, but just reflected and penetrate uh, and uh, to the uh, uh, being emitted out of the direction where it comes. And the third path is the absorption. So by interacting, what I explained to you before, by interacting with, with the pigments, the photons may also be absorbed. And depending on which pigments they interact with, with which components they interact, photons of a specific wavelength are differently transmitted, absorbed or reflected. And what I want to show you here is that if you now consider over the spectral window the three components which always have to add each other to three. So that's the only way transmission, absorption, reflectance. That's the only fate of photons. So these three components always have to add up to one. Means if you look for example in the visible range where you have all the photosynthetic uh, pigments, most of the pigments are absorbed. Almost none are reflected or transmitted with some minor peaks which cause the green color of, uh, of leaves. But if you look, for example, in the range of 100,000 100, nanometers, then you realize that almost no photons are absorbed, but most of the uh, photons are either reflected or transmitted. And by recording these uh, spectra, we can detect what is actually in the leaf by comparing the reflection, absorption and transmission. We have to uh, always keep in mind the thing which I told you before, namely that we have on the surface a spectrally different stream of incoming photons and to do, really get these kind of graphs you always have to normalize our data to, to the uh, incoming light. But now let's dig a little bit deeper. Two examples, chlorophyll and water and only look on the reflectance. So this is a modeling study which we uh, did a few years ago where we did a, where we modeled a leaf and where we could show how does the reflectance change if we for example change the chlorophyll content in our leaf. And what you see here is exactly what I also explained to you before. By increasing the chlorophyll content the plants absorb more and more uh, in this visible range and they reflect uh, less in the range between uh, 500 and 700 nanometers. So this is this typical absorption of chlorophyll and other um, uh, photosynthetic pigments which causes a change in the reflectance in the visible range. And in this model leaf you can also do this uh, differently with another component, for example with water. Again modeled leaf and we only change the water content and what you can see here, again the more water you have then you see the typical absorption lines of the water which happen more in the range between 1000 and 2500 nanometers which is a broad band absorption of photons in this spectral range because of the water content. And with this simple example you can already imagine that by looking at the changes in the reflectance you can separate what are changes which are caused by pigments or water or other plant co uh, components. Let's have a real, uh, real world example. This was a modeling study. Now let's go to a really simple experiment which colleagues at the University of Zurich performed. So they used a uh, branch of a plant, they cut it off and they let it dry for eight hours uh, on the high light. And what you see here is the time and how the reflectance changes during time. At the beginning you see the normal reflectance which I showed you before. And then in the first hours you see the increase of the reflectance in the longer wavelength which is the loss of water. 
That's what I showed also before. Absorption of water happens here and if the plant loses the water in the first hours after the detachment, the reflectance in this longer wavelength increased. Then after some time, so this again is the water loss, then after the, some time, approximately three or four hours, the plant also degrades the pigments and then you see suddenly this characteristic change in the visible range between 400 and 700 nanometers, which is the degradation and breakdown of the photosynthetic pigments of the chlorophylls and the carotenoids. Water loss followed by a few hours later pigment pigment loss, which both leave the specific and characteristic changes in the reflectance signature, which we can use for measurement purposes. So having established this, now let's come to the measurement, measurement parts. Um, we have established that the changes of the reflected photons and the wavelength characteristics is a good way to look into the components of a plant of a plant leaf and therefore we can use cameras which also have a specific uh, wavelength selectively to resolve these changes. Easiest way is to use a normal RGB camera. RGB stands for red, green and blue channel and a normal RGB camera, normal camera, color camera has three channels which are sensitive in the blue, green or red spectral window. Again wavelength and here the sensitivity. If you combine this camera, however, with another camera, which for example is only sensitive in the near infrared, then you already have a four channel camera system by combining these two cameras. And you can uh, push this a little bit further. You could also use filter wheels in front of the camera where um, selective filters um, uh, uh, allow only photons of a specific wavelength region to penetrate into the camera and you can step by step resolve the whole spectral uh, window by a camera equipped with this, with this kind of filters. In the past years, however, these kind of camera concepts were not so successful, but people have built more these kind of cameras where you have different small cameras aligned next to each other and each camera is equipped with a selectively bandwidth filter which uh, allows the penetration of only a small spectral window into this camera. And because cameras became so cheap, we are now in the meantime use five or ten different cameras, each equipped with a different spectral sensitivity uh, to measure plant properties. This camera, for example, has then different channels um, across the visible and near infrared range. And this, for example, the small scale camera here is one of the most widely used cameras for UAV drone applications uh, in the meantime. So having said this, so you can resolve your spectrum in mul multiple channels and this is then the multi-spectral measurements. But of course you can push this further and you can also build cameras which do not only have discrete channels anymore but which have several hundreds of channels which are producing a continuous spectrum. And this is then the case where people speak about hyperspectral cameras and hyperspectral channels. The separation is not totally clear as soon as you have a lot of channels and if you, as soon as you record a continuous spectrum, then you talk about hyperspectral cameras. And these hyperspectral cameras are normally a little bit more complex uh, from the use, but nevertheless, they are, can be used on the ground but also a lot of the airborne and satellite sensors are working with this continuous uh, scanning techniques because there you can use the forward movement of the aircraft or the satellite for measurement purposes. So with having this, you should know now what are RGB cameras, multispectral cameras with about five to 20 bands or hyperspectral cameras or sensors. And what do we do with this data, data at the end? So let's move uh, back to the principal scheme. So this was the reflectance curve which I showed you before from green vegetation and by using different bands which are um, well laid across the spectral window we can uh, retrieve the uh, properties of different surfaces. And if you look for example this is a graph of some satellites this is Landsat, which is the first satellite which was specifically built for vegetation monitoring. This is Sentinel-2, one of the most modern satellites which we currently use for vegetation monitoring and agricultural monitoring. These satellites are equipped with somewhere between 10 and 30 spectral channels, where each spectral channel is somewhere dis uh, uh, precisely described and laid and engineered um, uh, to resolve the different properties 
of the electromagnetic radiation. Um, in this context, a lot of the newer satellites are now hyperspectral satellites, <coughs> sorry, where you not, not have single bands but a continuous spectrum, but the measurement principle is the same. And if you look in the fleet of existing satellites which we have, it is kind of a technical uh, improvement during the years which we can observe the better the camera systems became, the more bands we could resolve with also, which is a compromise to the uh, spectral and temporal and spatial resolution. So it's always a question like how many photons can you still collect from a camera uh, in orbit uh, to get a good, good signal. And all the satellites which we have was always a consideration of what do you want to measure, how often, with which spatial resolution. And this was the way how the uh, satellites were built. And if you look on this overview, um, we are now at the point where the satellites get an increasing number of spectral bands and where also the spatial resolution is greatly improved that at the moment we can look from satellite platforms on single fields with several uh, to what, several hundred bands uh, spectral resolution. And for the application, how do we use this data at the end? The people who build satellite of course have another problem, namely that the photons which are reflected from the surface of the Earth, they have to penetrate through the Earth atmosphere a second time. And what you measure on uh, the satellite platform is often a mixture of this absorption in the atmosphere, reflection on the surface and absorption back on the upwelling path. And you have to do uh, this normalization that at the end we receive and we can measure this relative reflectance of the properties of the surfaces on the ground. This is something which is an own challenge. I don't go into the detail of this because this is normally done by the space agencies or the, by the remote sensing experts. But just in a nutshell, an approach which is used pretty often is that we use reference targets on the ground where we know exactly what are the uh, reflectance characteristics of this normalization ref reference targets. And by this knowledge, we can normalize uh, our remote sensing measures. Uh, if you go to, to satellites, these reflectance targets have to become bigger and or you can also use, and that's used a lot for optical remote sensing, you can use this invariant surfaces like salt flats or um, uh, desert areas which do not change over time to measure the characteristic reflectance on the ground to finally normalize your satellite data. But this, just as a side remark, at the end we get delivered from our satellite or from our airborne sensor these kind of reflectance curve where you have on the one hand the wavelength and then the relative reflectance of the property or the surface on the ground. And here I plotted you a few examples and again in the green line you see the typical reflectance of vegetation, in this case green grass. And by comparing this to other surfaces, uh, concrete or normal soil or also water, you realize that this typical change between low reflectance in the red and high reflectance in the near infrared, this so-called red edge is the really characteristic feature for all the vegetation. And this red edge is also not visible if you, for example, use a Kunstrasen or an artificial grass. This is the orange line. If you compare this, even though it appears green, it has the same hump there, it does not have this typical chlorophyll related, plant pigment related red edge where you have this sudden change between low reflectance in the red, high reflectance in the near infrared. And these parts are actually used by remote sensing. Um, if you then finally download these vegetation products, and this is an example which I downloaded uh, from Sentinel-2, one of the most modern European satellites for plant vegetation. This is Bonn, an image taken on January 14th, 2022. And the greener the color, the more wet green vegetation you have. And if you look on the picture which I downloaded there, you see this is a so-called NDVI picture or an NDVI image. And therefore, let's talk about what is an NDVI or what's the vegetation index. So back to the typical reflectance graph. And the NDVI is an 
old index which was already developed about 40 to 50 years ago together with the so-called simple ratio and these two indices just take the reflectance in the near infrared and the reflectance in the red. This is this uh, big contrast um, and they calculate either just the ratio or a normalized difference between these two re uh, reflectance measurements. And by doing so you get a value which is really typical for the amount of, to uh, of chlorophyll and the higher the value the more chlorophyll you have. This NDVI or simple ratio are still the most widely used vegetation indices but in the past years um, as we have more and more spectral bands available from the existing satellites also more and more um, uh, indices were developed which now not only use the red and the near infrared but also include green, blue and other spectral bands as they become available from satellite for a slightly better um, quantification of uh, plant pigments. But this uh, main concept of how to calculate this vegetation indices always remains the same. You take a few spectral, in, uh, spectral bands, they are calculated uh, by a simple formula to finally have one parameter which is a good proxy for uh, plant pigments. But they are not only vegetation indices for um, uh, chlorophyll but there is a whole lot of other vegetation indices which are for example called normalized difference nitrogen index, normalized different lignin index and these indices aim to exploit the other spectral absorption features which are caused for example by lignin, water, starch, so the other plant components. And if you go through the literature you will find most likely 50 or maybe 100 of these different indices in the literature and there's in principle nothing wrong with these but nevertheless I would like to ask you to be really careful with this because all these indices, well, the viewers of these indices are really specific. If you look on the absorption features of the other components you will realize that they, most of the other components have a really broad uh, absorption features which additionally overlay. So the absorption here at 1400 nanometers is caused by lignin, starch, cellulose and water together. So if you see a change in there you never know what is it caused by. Is it water? Is it lignin? Is it starch? So these indices they measure something but they all are lacking the uh, specific specificity which we normally would like to have in spectroscopy if we want to really use the changes in reflectance for specific measurements of the plant properties. Um, as water is one of the major and most in, uh, major component of interest people have spent a lot of time to resolve this broad band non-specific water absorption nevertheless and there are in the literature a lot of uh, good parameters around which use also the spectral changes in the near infrared for water retrieval, leaf or canopy water retrieval. However, these are then retrievals which are not only indices, which not only use a few wave bands, but which exploit uh, the spectral change with more uh, complex uh, algorithms to separate this from the absorption of other bands. So water measurements from spectroscopy is possible but you, do, you need more than just a vegetation index. Let's go back a little bit to the ground, back to the basics and think about what is actually behind some of the ground-based sensors which we know from agriculture. And one of the sensors which is on the market for a long time is the Green Seeker. Widely used vegetation in a sensor being mounted in front of a tractor and if you look a little bit in the detail what does really this green seeker measure spectrally then you will realize pretty quickly that this sensor is built to measure in two spectral wavelengths and exactly the two spectral wavelengths which I introduced before namely the red and the near infrared spectral wavelength and this again is this characteristic uh, uh, signature of the chlorophyll absorption. Other sensor which you may also know in agricultural science the Yara N seeker being marketed uh, for providing an N recommendation for the farmer. What does this sensor measure? If you look in the specification of the company we realize that this uh, sensor measures in four spectral wavelengths so it's a multi-spectral sensor but all these spectral wavelengths are arranged again at this red edge and resolve this again the same red near infrared spectral 
behavior of chlorophyll. So although the Yara N sensor again is an NDVI sensor or a greenness sensor, it does not measure chlorophyll. However, it uses this close correlation between plant chlorophyll and nitrogen, nitrogen um, uptake or nitrogen need uh, to give a nitrogen recommendation to the farmer. So two um, vegetation index sensors similar like the NDVI also for the ground. And with this, I hope that I had already give you an overview about what is really the nature of photons and how can we use photons to quantify plant traits. Uh, I think I could already introduce you to multi hyperspectral measurements and vegetation indices. And in the next two or three minutes, I would like to give you a brief hint or a brief look into another concept, namely what is fluorescence. So, Back to the concept that I showed you before. Plant pigments absorb light by using their energy and storing the energy in the energy rich states of their uh, electron system. This energy is normally used in photosynthesis and pigments absorb light specifically. But what happens to energy in the plant pigments which are not used in photosynthesis? So normally the energy is used by the plants to build up all the biochemical energy to fix carbon dioxide at the end. So to shuffle energy through a pretty complex biochemical, biophysical electron transport chain. But as soon as electrons cannot be used in this electron transport chain, they may be converted back to the ground state, to the S0 state. And this conversion back from the excited to the ground state may be associated by the emission of a new photon. And this emission of this new photon, this is the fluorescence light. So conversion of an energy rich state to the ground state by the emission of a photon, this is the definition of fluorescence. And in the case of uh, chlorophyll, which you see here, this is a chlorophyll solution, which we shine blue light on. In the case of the chlorophyll, if you carefully look from the side, you see a red glow. And this red glow, this is the red fluorescence light, which comes from energy is absorbed, is there stabilized for some while, and then the conversion back to the ground stays causes an emission of this red fluorescence signal, which is, by the way, an energy richer, uh, energy poorer photon. So in this Photons, these fluorescence photons, have one specific and nice properties which we as plant physiologists like a lot. So let's zoom into the properties of this reaction center of photosynthesis. Light is absorbed and the energy is shuffled to the so-called reaction center which then drives photosynthesis. But what happens if, we, if a plant experiences too much energy, too many photons which cannot be used in photosynthesis? then an increasing number of energy is converted back to the ground state and emitted as a fluorescent signal. If we now have a severe overenergization, more photons coming in because of highlight conditions or a blockage of the photosynthetic apparatus, which means that not all the photons or not all the energy can be used photosynthesis, then I have an increase of energy in the reaction center and the intensity of my fluorescent signal also increases. And this is the nice thing of uh, using this fluorescent signal as a measurement approach. By measuring the fluorescent signal, we can directly detect how much energy is in the reaction center, which cannot be used, which cannot be quenched by the photosynthetic machinery. So fluorescence is an indicator to look really in the properties of the reaction center into the energetization state of the reaction center. And if we are a little bit careful, we know that there's also other, um, there are other dynamic processes which the heart with the plant can turn on when to avoid and damage of the reaction center to dissipate energy. So there's another path of of light, but nevertheless, by measuring the fluorescent signal and the dynamics of the fluorescent signal, we can uh, calculate or we can detect how much energy is not being used and available in the reaction center. With this concept uh, going back, is this possible? And the answer is yes, it is possible. This red glow 
um, happens all the time when the plants absorb light and perform photosynthesis. It's a faint glow which you just barely cannot see with your eye, but if you already give you some glasses and use some spectral properties of the light, then this red glow can also be visualized to the human eye. And what can be seen with the human eye? Of course, we can measure with our uh, uh, instruments, with our scientific instruments. And in the moment, we have uh, several technical instruments on the market which exploit the dynamics of this fluorescent signal to get an insight into functional properties of photosynthesis. Most of these instruments, however, are these clip-on instruments. And even though we have at the moment, I made a literature review, about 750 papers published every year in the scientific literature, which uses this method to measure fluorescence to get an idea of photosynthesis. Nevertheless, all these papers and all these measures normally need that you are pretty close to your plant and that you can really control uh, the properties inside your plant. And this has, of course, limitations for the larger scale application. If you go to the field, if you want to measure hundreds and thousands of plants, if you want to cover larger areas, then these clip-on devices come to their limit. And this is the background why in the past years um, a lot of effort was um, put in to develop sensors which measure the so-called solar-induced fluorescence from remote sensing platforms. And nowadays we have um, aircraft sensors, but also scanning sensors in hand, which can resolve this uh, solar-induced fluorescence, the threat glow of vegetation from aircrafts and also from satellites. Um, there's one satellite which is currently being built by the European Space Agency named FLEX, which will be launched in two years from now, which is a dedicated fluorescence satellite to measure really the functional status of photosynthesis. However, to go into detail, this is another lecture. If you're interested in this, there are a few citations which you uh, can refer to. And um, I would like to come to an end of my overview lecture in this PILT series. I hope that I could give you some basic understanding on the physical, biochemical and uh, uh, properties which are behind this measuring of light by the use of spectrally resolved cameras and by the use of vegetation indices how they are applied for proximity and remote sensing and for agricultural scientists. And at the end, I hope that I could also give you a sum of the outflows that it's not only reflectance, absorptions and transmission, but that there's also a fluorescent signal which is currently being exploited for a deeper insight into the functioning of, of plants. Um, you will find some more reading on the website with this, with this talk, a few textbook, or also a link to several scientific overview articles which you can use for a further insight into the topic if you're interested. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for being with me and goodbye.